So I'm here with Nahum Diemer from Cloudbeat, the uh, company which brings to us uh, automation and orchestration goodness for test and QA, but we'll come back to that a bit later. What I'm actually more interested in is uh, a little bit your story, Nahum, and pretty soon Aaron will be joining us as well. Um, but I wanted to get started with you, in fact. So tell me, just like in a really short uh, summary to start out with, how did you end up founding a company? What brought you uh, from your life and career up to this point where you've chosen probably one of the most difficult paths that you can choose, right? Definitely not the path of least resistance. I'd be curious to hear a little bit about your background and how you got here. Sure, sure. So, you know, I, I made a long way <laughs> till, till this point, but I think probably some kind of entrepreneur spirit I, I probably had uh, early on in my childhood. Um, you know, I grew up in uh, Russian Georgia, and uh, I remember, uh, uh, you know, selling uh, dollar signs printouts <laughs> in the school. Uh, you know, it was just just kind of fun, but it was actually the first uh, kind of small money, but it was nice for ice cream and stuff like this that I started to earn. Oh, you mean like, like little uh, uh, dollar notes? Yeah, dollar <laughs> notes, uh, you know, and... Uh, so it, it was uh, it was a good business until they switched uh, in the shop. So I was buying it in bulk and I was selling in one by one. <laughs> so, you know, it was classical retail business. <laughs> so then somehow you figured out that in order to make dollar notes, you actually have to start a business instead. <laughs> yeah, no, it it was you know it's as all great things as it, it happened by incident, right? So I bought it for me. It was just looks interesting, and I remember it probably was you know it was surprised by a few a few cents or something and then the the kids in the school wanted to buy it from me <laughs> and they were buying one by one so i quickly realized that if you sell it you know and you buy it in stocks and you you can make a good profit so you know i was probably around 12 i would say yeah so, you know it was my first kind of entrepreneur experience back then uh, I love it. You, you tried to cut to the end. You tried to just make the dollars yourself. I love that. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, you know, back then, you know, obviously we had no printers at home, anything like this. And, and the business quickly shut down because they, st they in the shop, they switched from dollars to local Ge Georgian currency. Ah. And nobody wanted to buy this one. <laughs> so I literally ran out of stock. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it was a good good experience. I think it learned me a few things. Yeah. And, uh, I think, you know, another good thing, uh, which I think also touched me, teach me to work arounds, you know, to find workarounds, which I think is very important for an entrepreneur yeah. uh, to succeed is, you know, when I, I probably was in the same more or less age of 12, 11, and, you know, I got my first computer. The only problem is that back then, if you remember, computers were connected to uh, TV screens. Yeah. And, there were, and, you know, there were no... Flo floppy disk or anything you were literally using your you know just a cassette you know uh, the sync with the sound and was yeah and the thing is that when we, we initially uh, my my mother brought me a computer i didn't have a compatible tv so we had a tv but it wasn't compatible so i couldn't connect it and i was so frustrated and i didn't know what to do with it so i had a computer which i can't see what is on the screen and with the computer came a, a a basic book so how to program basic yeah. and i i don't know how i figured it out but i figured out that you know you could blindly enter commands and at the end to add the beep sound so there was a beep command and yeah. if it succeed if if the run was succeed then you will get beep beep at the end and this is how i started to program so i started <laughs> programming blindly with just adding beep command at the end so you know i think this is just to, to show kind of you know I think a lot of the things are, you know, you 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 kind of uh, form in the earlier in childhood. So you were and literally so, programming blind. Yeah, this is how I started with the base. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Learning by Pavlov almost, that was like rewards, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so, yeah, so just, just a few examples, you know, and uh, and I guess throughout my career, I always had some ideas and I wanted to implement it. It took me some time to get the guts to actually start the real business. Yeah. And uh, but but you know, I think you need to to go with your feelings and with your guts and you know and a little of believe in yourself and this is how you you get there.
Yeah. Well, I think you really, especially, I mean, I've, I've done it myself and I've worked in a lot of startups and I really, I learned you have to really know why you're doing it and have a passion for it because the, let's say the punishment you take for doing it is going to be much more. And if you yeah. have doubt, you know, then it's going to be a tough road, right? So I can imagine. Yeah. That. Yeah. Startups is really a tough road. So I definitely not for everyone. And, uh, you know, I think there are many ways how you can kind of, uh, you know, make yourself, right? So it's nothing wrong to be, you know, a, a good employee in uh, companies or be a great uh, artist or be a great journalist. So there are many ways. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm because I'm software engineer in my, my background and, you know, uh, I kind of, you know, my skills, basic skill set is to develop software. Yeah. So, you know, this is, uh, it was quite natural to find myself in, you know, uh, doing startups. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's quite a challenging route. Especially in the software development process, right? The, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I was—I think it was the guy who runs the Y Combinator, um, uh, the uh, what do you call that? You know, the incubator there. He was right. a podcast with him, and he would say that uh, an entrepreneur is a guy who signs up to get punched in the face every day. You know, it's not a That's normal guy. Right? <laughs> it's like who would do such a thing? You know, but I think on the other hand, what it does is it tests you, like. You, you go in kind of having a good idea of what you're good at, otherwise you wouldn't do it. And then you learn what you're bad at in the yeah. process. And sometimes you find out it's precisely the same thing, right? The thing you're good yeah. at is actually what makes the, the yeah. what is your biggest challenge. And, you know, I, I'd be curious to hear about like a lesson you've learned, like what's a, what's a mistake you've made or a lesson that you've had that really brought that out and really brought you further in your journey? Oh, man, if I need to count all the mistakes I made. <laughs> Just the fun ones. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, the cloud bit is uh, my, my current company is, is not the first startup I'm doing. So it's it's probably the third I'm involved in, mm -hmm. uh, the second that I'm uh, founding. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things you learn with the time. So, you know, you w whenever you are a first-time entrepreneur, um, so you are basically, I would say, you are probably blind and you are so naive, right? So you think, oh, I have this great idea, you know, I'm going to conquer the world and, you know, I'm just, I will write a few lines of code and, you know, everyone wants to buy it. Yeah. Um, and I think you very quickly learn that reality is different, right? So, you know, writing a piece of code uh, is, is really the easiest task, but it's, probably not most important, right? I mean, you need to find, to have in yourself and in your team so many skill sets, uh, you know, from technical one, which is probably easy for me as an engineer, right? But much more difficult sk skills, you know, you need to be a managerial skill, you need to be a good manager, you need to be a good salesman, you need to be a good leader, you need to be a good, uh, you know, Pitcher, pitcher, you know, you need to pitch everyone. Yeah. You need to have a lot of, uh, you know, patience because you hear no so many times. I mean, you mostly hear no. Yeah. So you know, you need, you need to have enough, uh, you know, to have enough strong uh, spirit and and a great team to, you know, to carry on. Yeah. Uh, so there are so many things, you know, and, and you learn it the hard way. I mean, you know, you always, I think, we in the, most of uh, people's nature is to be a naive mm -hmm. which is good because you know you can be entrepreneur without being a little at least a little bit naive right because you know if you are too pessimistic then you will always find reasons why not to do things and there are more reasons not to do than than let's do it right so i mean you need to be naive and uh, and you know and keep dreaming and keep uh, kind of believing yeah. Uh, in order to be able to do this kind of stuff. So, you know, there are so many, uh, I think, mistakes, uh, you know, I, I did. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to say particulars, right? But I, but I think probably the most important thing I learned out is that, uh, first of all, you know, uh, for every no, right, learn something new. Yeah. So no is not uh, a defeat, okay? So it's, 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 you know, it's just another way to learn what to do right, okay? And how to get next, yes. So I think this is probably a very important uh, lesson you learn with the time, right? 
because when you just start, you every no, it's it's like an end of the world, right? It's it's a big drama, and you think, oh, you know, all my assumptions are gone, yeah. and so on. And with the time, you learn, you learn that actually no is just a right pass forward. Um, so I think it's probably the biggest lesson you can learn uh, as an entrepreneur. You know, just yeah. just to carry on, to see why you got no, and to learn how you can get the next yes. Yeah, um, and there's a saying in sales that uh, the sales begins with no, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I love the uh, you know basically the emphasis on the optimism is so true because uh, it's related to that first point. You know that it's there's so many obstacles in the way that you have to have some driving an energy a need to do this. Why right. are you doing this, right? And uh, I learned I did this once where I uh, learned two things like that about the optimism. My first business plan had me breaking even after a year. And after three years, I realized it was going to be seven years, you know, <laughs> and um, yeah. And the other part, of course, is that, you know, the, the when you're an entrepreneur, as you know, your days are filled with things you're not good at and things you don't like to do because yeah. the other two things are already taken care of, you know, <laughs> they, they yeah, really true. Fine. True. True. so yeah. And then of course that there are so many mistakes to be made that you have to try them all. You can't be making the same one over and over again, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, it's uh, this is, I think, actually, when you compare enterprise, right, large companies with uh, startups, I think startups have a privilege to make mistakes. Yeah. I think in large companies, because, you know, stakeholders and the structure and the management and, and you know, revenue structure and, and all this, I think you are much less privileged to make yeah. mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's also a great part. I mean, you know, it's sometimes it's frustrating, but I think also a great part in being uh, in startups that you can make mistakes. And sometimes, you know, first of all, sometimes you can really have fun out of these mistakes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also you can learn a lot. I think you can learn much more than just, you know, doing everything by the book, which many times you find in, in a large enterprise. Yeah, no, absolutely. You're usually in a large enterprise, you come to take over a process from someone. And yeah startup you're there you know somebody's just pointing to a piece of grass and says put something there you know <laughs> yeah 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 and and i think also in startups you're privileged sometimes to completely turn you know 800 180 degrees which you can't usually do in in, in large enterprises right big shift so, yeah yeah big shifts and and big moves and and you know you, you're basically just free to do whatever you you want so you are a little bit like an artist which has a blank paper and you can start this blank paper every day over and over again, right? So you can decide what you will draw this day. <laughs> and welcome, Iran. Just in time, we were just talking about you. <laughs> yeah, I've been listening for quite a while now. <laughs> oh, oh, no, forget it. <laughs> so I'm curious, uh, one thing I've known in my experience, not only with, well, actually with startups, but even like large successful companies like Google and Microsoft and all of these, they, there's never one founder. There's not one guy, really, even if there's a famous one, there's always a second one, at least a second one. And there's usually different roles being played. You know, one person is often more, a little more of the risk taker that let's try things out, you know, let's see what happens. And the other one is a little bit more the careful one saying, all right, but let's be careful. Let's, um, you know, let's measure things. Let's watch out. Sometimes there's even a third one who's just a salesperson, you know, that just knows people. Uh, how do you guys work together? How did you get together? And what are your roles like with each other? How do you work together? Well, our story is actually, actually very strange. I was um, CloudBeats, one of its customers, first customers. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd say it's, a, it's quite a unique story. Um, I was managing a, a quality group in a bank in Israel. Mm -hmm. And I was looking for a solution for our test automation and continuous testing. And um, I was referred to uh, Nahum and uh, our third co-founder, uh, Roman. Mm -hmm. He's quite shy, so he's not joining us on this call. But um, we were looking for a solution for test automation. And suddenly, after the demo, everything just fell into place, you know, which was just you know, a per perfect fit. Um, and then we started working together for a while, about a year. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I left a year, a year and a half, and then when I left the bank, um, Calbit was at that stage in kind of a, I'd say, a, a design partnership, just really experimenting, not really a, an actual company, but just, you know, experimenting with all kinds of solutions. But already what I've seen was, you know, was really amazing. 
So when I left the bank, um, I was kind of um, thinking what to do. And that's when I um, joined CloudBeat and co-founded with uh, Nick and, and Roman the official company. That was in 2018. 2018. Wow, time flies. Yeah, that's the kind of story, yeah. So... Yeah. So whatever I, you know, whatever I'm selling, I actually experimented on myself. So you know, I have a good validation for everything I say. So you really did go from the corporate job straight into the startup world. What's that been like for you? Well, it's hard. So you know, I've been working for 20 years in in different enterprise companies, banks, and and financial services and startups as well. But but you know, more of enterprise companies. And suddenly, you know, to be in the, you know, you're responsible for everything. Uh, yeah, it's like, you know, it's living instead of um, fulfilling other people's dreams, you're fulfilling your own. I think that's the, the main thing. Yeah. yeah, I think for me, the, I always use the comparison. It's, it's not a, it's a little bit of a, for some people, it's probably not nice to hear, but I always compare it to like cooking, you know, that um, you can be a really great home cook. You can even be a really great restaurant cook. But uh, when you do a startup, you actually have to go out there and kill the pig yourself, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's usually a lot more than what people expect. They're used to buying the nice package stuff from the store. Like, you really have to do everything, just like you say. You know, there's nobody there to do it for you. Yeah, so true. So yeah. true. So th that's a great transition because I'm also interested in the founding story of CloudBeat. And what you just said, Iran, is that you were a customer and what you saw just clicked. It just made sense enough for you to actually, like, change your life, basically. What was it about the product? What was the problem that it solved for you that was unique that you said, this is it, this is where I need to go? Well, the thing is I was looking for two tiers of solution. One is really providing me a simple way to create test automation. Just taking the people that I have and transforming them from manual testers to test automation experts, mm -hmm. okay? And I didn't want to do it with a, a dummy tool, but really a tool that can, you know, evaluates the evaluates the, the the you know the the way that people work, and you know, and really helps them to pro to proceed with test automation. That was the first tier. The second tier was looking for something to manage everything, to to you know have a, a managerial view. That's for my personal use, to know how many tests were executed, where are our problems, where are the root cause analysis of our problems, and. When I went cloud, suddenly I saw that they actually solved both problems. So we, <clears throat> the first problem was of course solved by our open source tool, Oxygen. And the second tier is solved by um, the cloud. Beat. I'm sure we'll be talking about the product itself, but you know, and suddenly everything just fell into place. It was very, very clear to me that, you know, there's no, there's no doubt about it. This is what we need. Um, yeah. yeah, right. So just for context, the, the CloudBeat tool is a tool for automating software testing, right? So, you know, you have your developers developing software. They need to now finally actually check that it actually works. And what your product does is automate that, but also scale it up so you can do thousands of tests and much more than what you would do individually by hand. Exactly. So, yeah, that's great. And so why, why, maybe, hmm? maybe if I can add on top of it, you know, let, let's for a moment just put the technical side uh, aside. But I think also, because I know Iran also from before, so I think Iran was always a, a human person, right? So, I mean, he, he I, I remember that, you know, when, when I uh, work with a couple of other customers and they all knew Iran. So Iran was kind of a center of excellence. There were many QA managers in Israel coming up to see what he did in his organization. And I think one of great things about uh, Iran is that his passion was actually, you know, to, to, to present, to, uh, to kind of, you know, make other people stronger, right? To, to transform his knowledge to others. And I think, um, you know, at least for me, as, as a match was it, you know, uh, it's it's very important in startups, right? A is that you know you want to spread your wings, and I think it's probably you know being able to pitch people, and you know it's not just a pitch for to sell. I think we really have a unique DNA that we we really help people. Yeah. You know, I think it's very important. So because you know you you don't build startup just you know to sell and and just you know okay here's a product we sell it to you and that's all. So it's all really about solving the problem and really being helpful, right? Yeah. And and I think this is a great, uh, you know, uh, this this is a great passion in Iran to be to being helpful, you know, to to be able to help people to kind of present them, uh, 
you know, the solution right for their needs. And I think we can see it greatly here in, uh, you know, in this transformation from enterprise. So what I'm just trying to say, you know, sometimes when you work in enterprise, you have some mm -hmm. s something in you which is kind of hidden, right? But you, you know, you 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 might feel it, but you not necessarily have the right platform in enterprise for it to develop. And then suddenly, when you have an opportunity, you can spread your wings, yeah. and you know. It's like a muscle. I think this is great. Yeah, I think it's a great stuff. example here with with, with Iran and, and the transformation that uh, he made from uh, enterprise to startup. Yeah, and actually, it's an important point because in the end, you know, what we forget easily is that business is all about trust. That's all it is. So, you know, if yeah. you don't trust someone, you don't do business with them, and vice versa. When you trust them, you you find ways to do business with them. Yeah, even sales itself, it's like it's a theme that you know has come up with other uh, discussions and what we talk about. Sales is easy to get a bad rap because everybody's seen it done badly before. But when it's done well, it's a person you trust who can guide you in an expertise that you can't have, you know, and I think, sure. um, not only that you guys are doing that for your customers, but in fact, you're providing software for people who will do that for their customers. Yeah, and true. Great. True. I, see, I think it's, especially in startups, a personal touch, it's always important, but in startups, a personal touch and the trust. And I would say, uh, you know, the professional trust, not just, you know, oh, you are a nice guy, so I trust you, but also professional trust that, okay, this guy knows what he says and what he's doing and he can really help me yeah. is super important. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, so I, and I've, you know, I've worked with you guys as well, so I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> it's uh, it's, it's uh, very important. So I'm, I'm curious also, um, you know, when you uh, find a unique problem to solve and you start a company for it, one of the first questions you get from a potential investor, for instance, is, uh, well, why hasn't someone else done it, right? Uh, it's, uh, you can say, well, there's nobody doing it, so we're gonna do it. It's, okay, but why didn't anyone else do it? What do you suppose has been the barrier in the past for someone else to come through with this sort of uh, automation and uh, th like this type of platform that you guys do? Why was this the time? Well, I think, you know, it's, uh, you, you are touching some uh, pain points, you know, that uh, I, I think many startups have um, uh, because, you know, there are basically, uh, I would say there are probably two types of startups, right? Because there are some startups that have very unique uh, technological, uh, uh, you know, I, I, almost like algorithm or something, you know, uh, say Google, right? They develop some unique search mechanism, right? Which was very unique to them. And uh, and it was so so much different from what other platforms have. And then there is another type of startups, which I think there are uh, founders who are coming with their experience, with their know-how, okay? And, uh, and they just know from their experience that there is a problem which is unsolved. And I think we are the second type of startup. So... We've been in this industry for more than 20 years and, you know, we, we brought all our experience of, you know, how to do it, what's the best way to do, uh, you know, the testing on large scale and, and the DevOps and all the, you know, the, the technical stuff. And we implemented it in our platform. And while we, we have some also unique technical mechanism, I think this platform uh, unifies a lot of very unique experience that we have. And I think this is one of things why our customers like us because we really solve them the problem that you know many people from outside don't understand. You know, yeah. when you are in experienced in some field, there are some issues which you can understand if you are not sitting in this every day, right? And uh, you know, one of my recent hobbies uh, is uh, is airplanes, right? And you know, when you are just a passenger in an airplane, right? So it seems quite, you know, easy and simple, you know, oh, you take off, you, you fly, you land, that's all, right? But when you get into it, you realize how many parameters are there and how, how you know, strong skills and how many things a pilot needs to have in his mind to be able to fly the aircraft. And it's, it's far from being simple. And the same I think is here, you know, when you are in some, niche field, you know, some, some particular field or some particular problem that you are solving, especially if you're in B2B business, then you, it really comes to your experience and to very specifics of the problem you're solving. And I think we are very unique in this field because yeah. um, I, I, I think there are 
many startups are, are, are you know, built on base of some problem which somebody personally encountered, not necessary, he's expert in this field, and he said, okay, I'm going to try to solve it. I think here is a unique combination of a, a really severe problem that many of Oops, network. <laughs> mm -hmm. To deliver faster to larger amount of audience. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we also have the, you know, the experience, the waste of experience doing it. And I think this is kind of our unique um, value uh, for both for investors who invested and of course for our customers, which is the most important uh, because you know we are here to help uh, companies and and people, individuals to solve you know their um, testing and you know development problems. Yeah. No. First and foremost, you solve the problem for yourself, right? So that's uh, yeah. the best kind of startup. Yeah. True. And there's true. there's nothing more complex than simplicity. That's the other uh, takeaway. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. And Aaron, I think you have the most contact with customers. How do you see that for them? What's your, been your experience there? Well, I think the, 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 the pains that um, quality assurance and, and automation has caused or are trying to uh, solve are immense. And, and the thing is that it's, an, it's a market that, that is in transition. There's two huge change factors now in, in, um, in software development. One is the DevOps or uh, develop, DevOps uh, revolution that really changed the way we do, we pr produce code. The second was of course using Agile. Yeah. And both have managed to change Agile methodology just for the, someone who doesn't know, Agile means just pr producing code in, uh, or actually developing code in a very unique manner where you have small teams developing on small sprints of, of, of uh, of code and then just uh, uh, shipping that out every two weeks, which is a kind of a revolution because previously you used to just produce code once a few months. Now you add a, a, these two factors in where you have a for total, um, I'd say a total uh, assembly line of coding through DevOps and then everything is shipped very, very quickly as caused a huge pain in, in, in quality assurance because suddenly, you know, instead of having three months to check something and you can just you know ship it and just uh, develop it. Suddenly you need to do everything very very rapidly, and that's what we see. We see a lot of changes in these two factors that caused a lot of you know a lot of uh, disruption in the way people are doing their test automation. This is where we try and solve it by adding the factor called test um, test ops or continuous testing. Yeah. This is where we say, okay, there is DevOps, but there is also test ops because DevOps does not appear, does not work without test ops. It's just a, a, an, another link in the chain that is that is you know just as important as any other links in that chain. Mm -hmm. And what we see is this chain. This link is usually is the weakest link, and that's where you know where there's there's so much pain in there. Yeah, and I guess that's the a story of all of us in IT that people don't know we exist until something goes wrong. You know, it's like the guy who organizes the trains, you know, when as long as everything's working right, you don't exist. But when it's going wrong, suddenly you're the most important guy. And I think you guys are right in the, uh, at the at, right at the heart of that, you know, the, your customers as well. So that's really important. Yeah, it's so true. You know, it's so, so hard to appreciate or understand how quality and testing is important until you actually screw up, right? <laughs> until something happened to you in production and, you know, the bigger company you are or more, you know, more uh, customers are being impacted, suddenly you get it into your face and you realize, oh, you know, yeah. I probably need to, to pay attention to this. Yep, yep. no, no uh, quicker way to learn than pain, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and speaking of things not working, you know, I guess it's like the cliche question now, how has this whole COVID thing impacted your business, uh, not only your own company or your customers' companies, but you know, how has it also impacted how you're doing business and, and how things are going with you guys? Yeah, you know, I think in coronavirus time, uh, probably it's uh, most companies need just to reinvent themselves and reinvent themselves, not necessary to shift your product. Yeah, but it's uh, how you sell, you know, how you price things, how you package your offering. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's, you know, while it's it's quite a challenging time, I think for many startups, I think it's a great time to get 
get yourself rethinking everything and 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 really optimize and and make take yourself to the next level you know i think it's a great um kind of you know power injection uh into company to yeah. you know which pushes you forward right because you have no time to relax and say oh wait it looks good let me just chill out right um so you know i i, I think uh it it makes us think uh, and work twice as hard as before um you know, we already see a great positive impact of, uh, of strategies we've been changing and, and uh, product focus we've been changing uh, for the last uh, few months. I think we made a great uh, also uh, online marketing effort, uh, also with your help, guys, and, uh, and basically understanding things or, you know, kind of opening up our eyes on things that we We've been either just saying, oh, that's okay, it can wait, yeah. or, you know, we haven't been uh, watching it closely before. So, you know, while I think it's a, it's, it's a tough time for, for many of us, I think I've seen it as a, as a kind of empowering period, period. Mm -hmm. and I believe we will get much stronger out of it. And definitely we, we start personally in a cloud that we start to see uh, already a positive impact uh, on, on the company in a way, you know, and new verticals that we we reaching a new kind of company types we are reaching. Um, suddenly a new uh, product uh, perspective we're seeing. Uh, so I think it's, uh, we, we will get out of it much stronger as a company, I think, uh, with, uh, with probably also much stronger offering uh, and uh, with new customer sets, we, which we probably haven't been thinking uh, before to reach out. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I think it's shifting everyone. We used to talk about all what was possible and now we talk about what's actually important, right? That seems to be the shift in focus. Yeah, yeah I think this is a great point, Lee. I think we suddenly, you know, throw, threw away everything which we thought is important, but it's not really. And I think it's a great momentum to really be, you know, so much focused on what's really important, you know, what's really makes the bottom line. And it's not just, you know, bottom line from sales perspective. I think it's a bottom line also from your impact as a company, right? Mm -hmm. Your values, you know, why you do it, what what you do it and, and how your customers are really benefiting from it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Aaron, have you seen the same kind of thing with the customers that you're working with, that you're coming in contact with? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that I've noticed is that you could actually, um, that people are more approachable for two reasons. The first reason, I think they're at home. And suddenly, you know, all this garbage time, coffee breaks and all of that has just gone away. And suddenly they're just working. You just have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with anyone. Just like so that. <laughs> yeah, it's just simple as that. The other thing is people, you know, are now less tend to, to, to be uh, biased to ge geographical distances. So I can talk to anyone anywhere in the world. And it's just the same way as I've been talking to someone, you know, living six blocks away. So suddenly, you know, I can reach someone in Idaho or in, uh, in, or in Australia. It doesn't really matter because he or she knows that it doesn't matter if I'm talking to him, you know, 6,000 miles away or six blocks away. They still have the same effect. I can't really come to his company to help him and he'll, he'll have to build the whole mechanism for me to work for him with him remote. Yeah. And in that, in that way, I think it's, a, it's an amazing uh, transformation. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so yeah, that certainly has, has benefited us. But I you think, know, COVID is difficult. And I think like, you know, probably what we all have in common is that we've worked remotely most of our careers for different reasons. And now we're seeing that even our customers are used to this now. They even now want to work remote. And it's really... Right your reach like for better and worse you know in the old days when i had to drive to visit a customer i could see maybe two in a day and now i can see like seven or eight of them and you know that's got a, that's a double-edged sword but <laughs> it's certainly yeah. effective and i want to point out something i really love iran is that your background on zoom right now is an exact photo of your real office so it's like it's almost like you haven't gone anywhere you really miss it don't you <laughs> i'm actually in the office right now so i'm just using the virtual background but if i remove it you'll see it's the same office i'm, the same thing. <laughs> I'm sitting just here <laughs> uh, 
that's great. That's another thing we all but, have in common with Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't know you if the, if the world is real or virtual, it's just the same thing now. <laughs> so I am sitting in this office, but using a virtual background of the office. Uh, so, so poetic, so appropriate. <laughs> yeah, you know. You know, it's a fun, we're living in funny time when I think the Inception movie is, is suddenly much more relevant, right? Sometimes you can't really distinguish if you are within the dream, you know, or you are actually awake. Uh, I found movies got boring because the plot and the news is more interesting. You know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so one, one more question I have about the business itself, and then, you know, we'll, I'll kind of close out with some things to think about. It's, I'm interested in the, you're basically running an open source business, right? Your uh, core product is an open source framework. Correct. How, how is that different than selling an actual product or a license? I think there's a lot of implications that, you know, um, aren't obvious until you've actually been in that business. What's that like? Yeah, I mean, be, being in open source business is like walking on very thin uh, edge. It's like walking on the edge, you know, it's... Uh, um, it's, it reminds me, by the way, another movie about the French guy who walked in between two twin towers in New York, right? Yeah. So it's, it's almost like walking on a thin rope, uh, which is, you know, just uh, between two uh, yeah, skyscrapers. Because the reason why is because, you know, the open source, I think the open source model in, in, in its core is, uh, of course, is associated with a free, right? While I think... The core of open source wasn't about free. It was more about collaboration, right? That you can actually share the pieces of code. You can collaborate. You can learn from each other. Yeah. Still, I think in many organizations, the perception is that, first of all, it's free. Yeah. And, of course, for commercial organization, it's, it's a challenging to cross this barrier, okay? Because, I mean, we, we build the core of our business in open source uh, First of all, because of our beliefs, right? Because, you know, in testing, there are many great tools and frameworks which is are, are, are open source, like Selenium, Appium, and name few, right? So we, we, were, we are big believers in open source and collaboration and sharing, and this is why we build also one of our core products as open source and free. And we invested great amount of time in documentation and in the, within the code commands and so on because we, want, we wanted to make our code both shareable and actually to share experience with our colleagues. Uh, on the other side, we're still a commercial company and, you know, everyone wants to bring salary at the end of the month, you know. And so I think this is challenging to kind of keeping it open source on one side and on the other side still being able to bring a financial model which makes sense. Yeah. And, uh, and I think this is the most challenging part. This is why I'm saying it's like walking on the edge because if you are becoming too much commercial right then suddenly you know oh you know you are open source so you know it's kind of people see it in kind of coming in contrast yeah, on the yeah. other side if you are too loose on the open source sides and you know how you make money you know, so i think we've been unique in this sense that we build the core product as open source and then we build a reporting analytical solution which is a commercial part on top of it so i think this unique combination allowed us kind of combine on one side really to be able to collaborate and share and contribute and the most important part right which is an engine or you know a testing engine and and how we do things yeah. on the other side to keep ourselves some part of, of, of our SaaS product and being able to charge money on it and eventually make you know make some profit on it and I think this is a great combination which allows us to be both kind of sides, right? Earn money and be collaborative, being supporting yeah. and, and, and contributing. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we closely watching our other colleagues and so many open source great companies, you know, like Elastic and many other companies yeah. which, which base their product on open source. And I think it's an ongoing challenge that, uh, you know, uh, especially now in, in coronavirus time, becoming stronger and stronger. But I must say that, you know, also in coronavirus time, I think if you, you have, you know, some of your product open source, it's actually a great sale point as well. So, you know, we can say, uh, say that, you know, even so we had some initially tough time, you know, to build the right model. I think now in coronavirus time, it's actually helping us um, because it makes much easier, you know, for organization to decide taking something uh, which which has, you know, zero cost uh, 
initially and then decide, you know, if it brings in value, they can then, yeah. you know, grow up uh, together with us and, uh, and purchase some, you know, slightly bigger commercial license and so on. Yeah. No, that's true. I, I always think of I, I'm full of the uh, food analogies because I love to eat. But uh, <laughs> that to me, open source is like fish. You know that uh, in a way, the ocean has uh, it's full of free fish, but somebody yeah. has to go get it. You know, and and right. back and uh, and do all the thing. And I think that's the purpose of an open source business. But the benefits for customers are really straightforward. For number one, you're not selling a product and walking away. In order for you to have a business, they actually have to use it. So you actually right. have to provide something of value and that's good for customers. And secondly, I guess you have a theoretically uh, infinite development team, you know, develop, depending on how big the community gets, you can have all of those uh, brains working on your product. Right. So, yeah, it's really great. And then as you say, right, it's a low entry point for a customer. You know, you can just download the open source. Has that been helpful to like get them up and running on the open source version? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, as you said, it's a great entry point. I think, you know, if we look at the open source kind of commercial open source project, right? So I think, A, because they're open source, they gave probably more trust. Uh, it's kind of building initial trust with a customer. Mm -hmm. And B, definitely an entry point, which is easy. Just, you know, take it, try it, use it, you know, no obligations. Uh, so I think it's definitely two things which which basically build a relationship between the company, which basically is yeah. behind the open source project and the end user. Uh, and uh, again, and I think eventually, you know, the idea is, I think every open source project, which is commercial, you know, anything from Red Hat Linux, right, to Elastic and so many other great projects is that, you know, once you really benefit on large scale in an organization, uh, so, you know, you can, can, can also contribute your part and, and, you know, pay something and share and, and you know, and bring all this goodness back to, to the community. Yeah, that's great. So one, one thing that's clear is, you know, the value for a test a QA engineer, you know, the people that actually use the product. But I'd be interested to hear, you know, in, in the interest of time, you know, in a very short way, if I'm the CEO of the company or, you know, a product owner or somebody who is maybe not suffering day to day with uh, quality issues, but it has a direct interest, what should they be thinking about? What should they be asking themselves in this regard? You know, what is the value that CloudBeat brings to them? Well, I think, you know, when, when you are top management, right? So you basically have two concerns, right? First of all, are your customers happy with the product you're offering, mm -hmm. right? And, and B, I think, you know, what are basically your, your cost of development and cost of, of supporting this superior quality, right? Um, so I think what, what we as a cloud, because a platform offering is, is basically a relief in sense of being able to, you know, go sleep to your bed and knowing that the product you, you have in production it does has a superior quality and you can actually you know, sleep well and, and not think about, oh, you know, will I have a production issues? Did I deliver the version too fast, right? Was, a, was you know, my uh, agile cycle too short or did I push too many? There, was, there are so many concerns on both on product level and CEO level, you know, with this crazy, um, you know, release cycles and this really, you know, I think most of software companies today are are pushed to their edges, especially in coronavirus time when we need to push versions so so often and so fast. And so I think with our intelligence AI-based platform, we really kind of give you assurance that you know your product is okay and, and we can uncover you know defects and uncover different stability issues so much earlier in the cycle. So you know you can handle them earlier and you don't need to get to production and figure them out there. And on the other side, I think from value proposition, I think we probably have one of the best value proposition, which means, you know, you can really A, uh, save money, okay? Yeah. Because, you know, many times companies, even if they take open source free solution, it's just, you know, eventually end up costing you more people, you know, more uncertainty because uncertainty also costs uh, cost yeah. money. And of course, if, if you end up being with your defects in production, it's cost you a huge amount of money. So I think we have this, good combination, which we really see is appreciated by our customers. So, you know, we let them really sleep well at night and we we can constantly show them the ROI that whatever they pay, you know, it, it makes, makes sense and it saves them money and it makes them much uh, 
coming up with much stronger product. Quality and time to market, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, any thoughts, uh, Iran, on that? Yeah, I think one of the things that we try and do, and I think is quite unique, is to not um, force ourselves on the customer's solution. And I think that's been done too much. So a customer usually would have to buy a whole tool chain or a certain solution and to actually do a transition to that specific tool chain. What we do differently is we say, okay, we accept the fact that each company has its own tool sets and all you know the way they do things. And what we try and do is to actually add a layer of quality integration or, or software or continuous testing over whatever they have. So if they have their own CI, CD tool, Jenkins or whatever that is, or they're using this test automation tool or another, they can simply just integrate our tools very seamlessly. And I think that's the amazing thing. That's the really secret source about what we're doing is to try and take this company and seamlessly transition it to continuous testing without changing the whole procedures and throwing things away, but rather using exactly what they already have. And I think that's really been our, um, I think our uh, contribution to, to the way things are doing now in, in continuous testing. The other is really taking um, things that are tried to do, people would do them for many, many months to take to create continuous testing by themselves and a kind of a DIY solution and rather doing that, just giving them a solution which will, in a few days, enable them to start working on continuous testing, running parallel test cases, thousands of test cases on hundreds of mobile devices or browsers without trying to build a whole infrastructure will take them a year to build. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's the, that's the value proposition that we're offering. Yeah, that's Seamlessness and quick of uh, implementation. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. And of course, you know, this uh, particular conversation was really to get to know you guys, but on your YouTube channels, you have a lot of really great uh, demos that go in depth and really show the product. So uh, I think we'll have some follow up uh, conversations on that topic as well. But uh, this has been great. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, it's good to get to know a little bit about you guys, your background, how Cloudbeat came to be. You know, I've loved working with you guys. So this, is, uh, this has been a lot of fun. Hopefully uh, it was great for you guys. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Luis. Thanks for the opportunity. It was great chat. And uh, yeah, let, let's continue, you know, do a great things. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get stronger out of all, you know, coronavirus stuff uh, together. Absolutely. No doubt. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. Thank Take you. care.